National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the people whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here, as another public service, is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Kuril Island, stepping stones to Tokyo. Islands be taken, the Japanese would lose strategic advantage in the north. For here the Japanese control the northeastern approaches to Japan. And should they lose the northernmost Kuril, they would probably be deprived of the rest of the chain and be compelled to withdraw to Japan proper. The Kuril got Japan's first line of defense. He is speaking of us. The Kuril, as men have talked of us for endless years. The Kuril stretched 750 miles northeastward from Japan to the great peninsula of Kamchatka. We are a chain of islands, mountain peaks jutting out of the sea. On Paramashiro, the Japanese have built a powerful wireless station and an air base and a naval base. Yes, all these. And a great weather observatory. A weather observatory. Yes. The nation that controls the weather observation holds the advantage in this forlorn region. Yes, for around us here, the weather is made. In the northwest, we are washed by the cold Kuril current. And on the southeast, we are washed by the Japanese current. We stand like sentinels, shrouded in fog most of the year. Kurils. Kurils. A Russian gave us this name. Kurils. Smoking Island. The Russians came from the north, from Kamchatka. They came in expeditions moving southward. The Japanese moved northward. They met on Hokkaido. Look at them. Here they come, the Japanese. From this ceremony, they regard us highly. They have not heard us yet. The chief of the samurai has granted us this audience. This cortege of Japanese is in our honor. Wait till they hear us. The strange ceremony this is. They walk stiffly with downcast eyes and arms akimbo. They are stopping before us. Yes. They are saluting us. What a strange salute. They raise the hand to the forehead and bow the body to the waist. We must return their salute. Salute, yes. Prince, Samo is honored. You will come with me to the chief, please. We come to you as officers of our Imperial Majesty, Catherine the Great of Russia. You have come here to establish relations with the land of Samoa? Yes. We have explored the islands to the north as we came southward, one island to another. The islands you refer to are the property of the land of Samoa. The Russian Empire has claimed them for near a century. Yes, and in 1711, the native peoples of the island took an oath of allegiance to the Russian expedition of Antiferov and Kotirevsky. Japanese were on the islands years before that. We come as friendly emissaries of our queen. The islands belong to Japan. But your land has need of trade. The islands have no need of trade. If you would trade with the land of Samoa, you must go to Nagasaki. There, foreigners are permitted to trade with the Japanese. The wind swept over our crags and the fog settled upon us. The waters of the Pacific slashed against our rugged shores and mountains. 
And the years passed as we saw the Russians and the Japanese move in upon us. The Russians from the north, the Japanese from the south. Working men, fishing men, and soldiers. Always soldiers. Men, we have come a long way on this mission. In a moment now, we'll go over the side, down into the boats. The fog will give us cover until we land. Each of you has his instructions. The Japanese have refused friendship. They have refused to trade with us. When we went to Nagasaki with the letter from our czar, the tycoon, they ordered our ship out of the harbor. They have taken the Russians prisoners. We've come now to right these wrongs. Now, every man, over to the side. They came through the fog on Esorofu Island, up through the fog and crept on Shana Castle. Do not fire until I order. Castle was burned. The Japanese soldiers who were not killed or captured fled to the hills. And there in the gloom, to the sound of the eternal wind and the waves, the Japanese officer in command ended his life by harakiri. As the wind and the waves sang dolefully year upon year, so the struggle went on. Russian against Japanese. Here was growing an enmity that was to last down through the years. In the name of the Tsar of the Russian Empire, I'm empowered to propose the exchange of the island of Sakhalin for the Kuril Island. It is on the basis we have agreed? Yes. Russia will cede all of the Kuril Islands to Japan, and Japan will cede all of the island of Sakhalin to Russia. Japan will accept. <laughs> Japanese took us in 1875, all the Kuril Islands. Now more ships came, cargo carriers and fishing boats and hunting schooners. Hunters came from places as far away as America to hunt seal and sea otter. They crossed the seas in their schooners, and from the schooners they went out in their hunting boats. Six men went out in each boat. Four men to row, one to steer, and one to hunt with a gun. All right, keep the other two boats about 700 yards astern of us. Yeah, they're in position now. One on each quarter. Uh, they take for hunting. Look at that sea. Smooth as glass. Yeah. But look at the fog. Almost down to the water. Well, when you've hunted as long as I have, you'll know that's what makes it good. Well, that fog's only 50 feet above the water. Yes. Notice how milky it makes the sea look? So, what's the good of that? Well, you can spot an otter a long way off on a sea like hey, this. Hey, pipe down, you there. Hunter must have his eye on something. Well, how does he know it isn't a sea lion or a bird? Come on, pipe down, I said. Yeah, and lay on those oars, you two. <laughs> Hunter should know by now if he's raised an order. Yeah. You back there, pipe down. Shut him up, sir. Pipe down. We've been high boat this season, and I propose to keep a high boat. We can't keep on bringing in orders. You keep rapping. That's for you. Uh, uh, Sarah. Yeah. That's an order laying up there on his back. Lift your paddle. Signal the other two boats. Right. Yeah, the other two boats got the signal. They're lifting their paddles, too. All right, now straight ahead. Did you get him? No, oh, he died. All right, straight ahead now. Straight ahead. Lay on those horns. Now, uh, watch 
watch for him now. He's probably swimming straight for us under the boat. I'm watching the stern. Come on, lay on those doors. Hey, there he is. Huh? Stern of us. 200 yards. Yeah, right where we want him. In the middle of the three boats. Hey, the other two boats have spotted him, too. Slow the boat down, sir. We've got to keep that otter between the three boats. All right, he's up there. That was a hunter on number three boat. Did he get him? No, nah, the otter died. Keep your eyes open now. He's liable to come up anywhere. There he is. There he is to starboard. Yeah. Yeah, he's breaching. Jumping out of the water. Swimming and jumping and swimming. He's going away from us as fast as he can make it. Did you get him? Ah, oh, he's a wily cuss, this one. He's making his long dive now. Come on, lay on those oars. But it's got to get him when he comes up this time. We're going to lose him. Lay on those oars. Lay on them, will you? How that hunter can keep his balance up there in the bow of the boat and hit anything with that rifle while we're going like this is more than I can see. I got him. Huh? Got him. All right, pull straight ahead. There he is. Okay, he's up. He's up there. Feather your lord. Yeah, that's it. All right, now, come on. Give me a hand. Pull him aboard. Oh, that hunter have held out much longer or I would have given up. All right, come on. Give the hunter a hand. Yeah. Let me get a hold of it. All right, come on. Here we go. All right. Now, up. Over up. the side. Uh, up she comes. Over the side. That's it. Uh, yeah. There we are. Hey, that's a beauty. Boy, it was a good run, it did. Yeah, what do you figure this one's worth? Well, it's a pretty good size one, about four and a half feet long. Weighs, I'd say, around 80 pounds. It's a dark one, too. That means it's worth top price. Well, I'd say this one on the London market ought to bring from 1500 to $2,000. Our hunters came year after year. We saw them go away loaded with pelts. Many of the schooners with all their pelts were lost and their crews drowned. The Japanese hunted them down wherever they were. And at last the rocky points and reefs where the sea otters lived were nearly barren. The sea otters had been hunted almost to extinction. Japanese built fishing villages and fished our waters for herring and salmon. And ships from other nations, commercial explorers and adventurers, came to our waters. Would you have some more curry, Captain Brewster? Curry? Yes, that I would. Thank you. Oh, uh, pass the mustard, Mr. Hawkins, please. There you are. Ah, oh, thank you. Hey, half a mouth. What's that? That sulfur smell. Oh, I do, Smelly. Oh, I do. Must be powerful coming right into the wardroom like this. This is your first cruise up here to the Kuru's, Westby. <laughs> the first time up in these waters it is, Captain. Uh-huh. Well, those fumes are coming from the volcanoes over there on the islands. Way out here. Well, we're closer to those islands than you think. Ah, oh, is it safe to be this close? Yes. The islands are surrounded with fields of kelp. Some of that kelp grows down 150 feet. Yes, it usually gives you warning that you're near land. Well, I can't see others. I see. Hey, what's that? The old vessel is trembling. Are we into the kelp? Sorry. Oh, I've got a feeling that we've done a great... Yes, it felt like we ran into something. I say, look out up there. You feel the vessel tremble? No, sir, I didn't feel anything. You suppose you heard that hissing sound? Look out. Did you hear that hissing sound? Yes, sir. I didn't hear anything out of the ordinary. I suppose that was, Mr. Hawkins. Well, I guess understand. Everything's shipshape up here on take. Hey, there it is again. It's trembling in the air. Shaking the old vessel. That's an earthquake, or a sea quake, at the bottom. Earthquakes are frequent along the islands. How long do these things usually last? Oh, there's no telling. Listen to that. 
sounds almost like thunder. That must be a bad quake down there at the bottom. Hey, will you look? Look there to shore on that black mountain. What, Mr. Westby? That, that, that mountain there. Why, the old side of it's breaking up. You see? The entire slope right down to the sea. Yes. Yes, that's what's happening. Why, it's an upheaval. Look at those rocks rolling right down off the mountain into the sea. It's as if a big animal of some kind is burrowing under that mountain. Look! Why, oh, there's steam and smoke coming out of it now. Yes, just hissing out of it. Look at those birds. Clouds of them rising and screaming from the mountain. We'll change our course and put out to sea, Mr. Hawkins. Aye, sir. I'll take the wheel. Well, uh, how long will that go on, Captain Brewster? They go on for weeks or even longer. We'll put out to sea and return when it's safer. For ages, we have seen our mountains thunder and stir and change like this. The boats and ships went out to sea. And when the mountains had stopped moving, they came back. Two of the men came ashore. Crikey, these rocks are warm, Captain Brewster. I can feel them right through the sole soles of my shoes. Yes, yes, they've been heated deep down in the earth. Yeah, that eruption broke up this rock as if it was broken by a great hammer. Changed the entire topography. Hey, <laughs> there's our vessel out there, Captain. Uh, looks mighty small anchored out there all alone, down it? That's the safest place for it. Tomorrow we'll let Mr. Hawkins and some of the other members of the crew come ashore. Aye, sir. Well, will you look at this? Oh, a warm spring, eh? Why up here in a northern wilderness? Warm water. How cold is the sea out there, Ken? Oh, I should say it's about 36 degrees Fahrenheit. What it usually is in the summer at this parallel. Look at that. Warm water runs down and fills up those hollows in the rocks. Yes. <laughs> They're like steaming bathtubs. Want to take a bath, Mr. Westby? Well, Captain, I don't know. Well, it's your last chance for a long while. Well, uh, you too, Captain Brewster? Well, yes, it might be a good thing for me, too. I don't know. That's a cold wind coming up. That it is. Uh, maybe it's too cold to undress and get into this warm water. Huh? Right? Uh, yes, hey, believe that. Hey, we're going to have a bath, though. Look at that vessel out there. Hey? The wind is tossing her about. Wind's getting stronger. Come on, Mr. Westby. Let's get back to the ship. Hi, sir. You watch yourself. Terrible blow. Hi, sir. Watch out you don't get knocked down. Hi. Look. Wind's whipping up those waves. The horse covering the ship. You must be dragging her anchor. Wind and the waves are almost blowing her over. Caught up with her before she could move. Captain Brewster. Oh, Captain Brewster, she can only... She... Oh. It's got her. It's got oh, her. No. She's going over. Oh, oh, she's... She's... Good God in heaven. She's gone over. The waves threw her over. Oh, Captain Brewster. The crew. Mr. Hawkins and all the crew. They're lost. Lost to a man. Every one of them. Come and go. We stand here in the fog and mist and watch man struggle upon us. The Japanese spread through all our 32 islands. They built fishing villages. Wherever they went, they took over from the natives of the islands, the Ainu, whom the people called barbarians. are the Ainu. We have been on these islands for centuries before the Japanese came. The samurai came and hunted us down like animals. They hunted and killed us for the sake of glory. Once there were many of us Ainu, now there are few. White men from far across the sea came to study the Ainu. They watched them hunt and fish, by which means the Ainu lived. 
and they made notations of the strange character of the Ainu. Yeah, look at that fellow there. You see, he is notably whiter than the Japanese. Yes, considerably more like us. You see, they are broad-shouldered and stocky, very stalwart. If they were washed and combed, they'd not be so wild of countenance. But look at that hair. I've never seen such beards and shaggy heads. They're not so hairy as I've heard reported. Contrast is probably with the Japanese and Chinese. The hair makes them look ferocious. But if you look closely, you'll see that they have a gentle expression. See the large brown eyes. Fishing season. The villagers have a population probably between 10,000 and 15,000. But in the population in the military installations, that is another thing. Now, for the past years, the Japanese have been coming in greater numbers. They come with great machines and strange contrivances never before seen on our island. They drill holes into the rock to pack it with a strange substance, and then they run from it. Rocks fly high, and they repeat this process again and again. Then they come with powerful machines that roar as they scrape the surface flat. Thousands of Japanese work to smooth the surface. And then come airplanes, many of them. And in the harbors, tall machines that pound, drive piles into the ground at the water's edge. Upon them soon, the Japanese are securing strong timbers, building wharves. Out of the ships that move up to the wharves come more Japanese. Great steel arms lift out war machines that rumble and shoot out death. On Paramushiro and our other northern islands, the Japanese are working and building and digging in, from the mountain slopes down to the sea. And always the Japanese are looking, looking out across the waters, looking up into the skies, and listening for the drone of airplanes. About five minutes, Colonel. Very well, Captain. Visibility seems to be good. Better than usual, sir. Our position is uh, uh, right at this point on the map now, sir. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks, Lieutenant. You see, the island of Paramashiro is about 60 miles long and 14 miles wide. Mm-hmm. Paramashiro and these two other islands here, Sumashu and Naraito, these are the eyes of the Japanese here in the north. Yes, sir. From the airfields on these islands, they can observe any movement around them. Even the movement of the Russians up here in Kamchatka. Uh-huh. Pernamashiro is the biggest of these northern islands. Chances are it is the most heavily armed. Of course, the weather is one of the major problems in our operations up here. Yes, sir. But the weather is as much an ally of ours as it is of the Japanese. Except that the Japanese have a weather observatory here, and that gives them an advantage. The weather in a great part of this area is made here. The cold Kuril current comes down here through the Okhotsk Sea along the northwestern side of the islands, and the Japanese current comes up here along the southeastern side. And the confluence of these two streams has a great deal to do with the making of the weather here. And the weather goes out from the Kurils in all directions, doesn't it, Colonel? That's right. So the Japanese, who are right here, more about what the weather will be around the Kurils than anyone else. And that's important in the control of the air routes between North America and the Far East. One thing in our favor, sir, is that we know the exact location of that weather observatory. Yes. The weather observatory is on our list, Lieutenant. We also know that the two best seasons out here are May and October. And October is really the best, Captain. 
The winds are fairly boisterous in May. Pilot to Captain Addison. Pilot to Captain Addison. For you, Captain. Yes. Captain Addison from Pilot, go ahead. Tayaba at 12 o'clock. Tayaba at 12 o'clock. Over. Tayaba at 12 o'clock. Over. We picked up Tayaba? Yes, sir. Dead ahead, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Cameras ready? Yes, sir. Man old gun? Yes, sir. We should get a good view of Karamashiro and the other northern islands, Colonel. The mountains are pretty well shrouded with fog. It's better today, sir, than I've ever seen them before. Look at that water down there. Rough. Yes, sir. The currents are swift and treacherous. The wind whips them up into a froth. Not too rough for submarine bases. What's that down there? That strait. That's Paramashiro Strait, sir. Sometimes it's called Little Kuril Strait. Can't be more than about a mile wide. It's a mile wide at this narrowest point, sir. Five miles long. Uh, some good anchorages down there. Shelter a good many vessels. Pretty rugged country, Colonel. Uh, yeah. Look at that peak there. Yes, sir. Dangerous in the fog. Drops off in a sheer cliff right down into the sea. Yes, sir. Notice that mass of mountains on this northern end of the island? The highest on the western side. Uh, so I see. They're bolder and steeper to the west. And the coast facing the Pacific Ocean is low and rocky. It is spotless, sir. They're opening up with Akak. That's Akak, all right. He'll have it from now on, and it'll probably get worse as we go along. Looks like every rock down there has an Akak gun on it. You can expect Jap fighters to come up after us now. And they'll be up after us, all right, but we'll keep right on going. Two o'clock. How many of them? Three of them. No, four. Four enemy fighters. Two o'clock. Here they come. Get them. All right. What's that? They're coming up under us. Yes, sir. Keep directly on the planned course for our objective. Instruct the cameramen and the rest of the crew to keep their eyes open. One of these days, we're going to be coming back here. the fighting is in the skies above our peaks. One day, perhaps, it will be in our treacherous waters and on our rugged terrain under our shroud of fog. One day, other peoples may fight their way onto our island. For it has been said that should the northernmost Kuril be taken, the Japanese would lose strategic advantage in the north. And should the Japanese lose the northern Kuril's they would probably be deprived of the rest of the chain and be compelled to withdraw to Japan proper. The wind and the waves slash against our fog-bound island. Someday, we may be stepping stones to Japan. to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. We repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, Send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>